a bit easier than I thought. Um, right, first of all, I need to make a safety announcement. Um, no fire alarms are scheduled. If the fire alarm sounds, please remain seated. So it says on my bit paper. And the venue's technical manager will come to the stage floor to coordinate the evacuation and obviously save us all. So um, that's, uh, that's what I just needed to tell you. Um, uh, a Thank you very much for taking the time to come out on a, a dark all time or evening to hear what agencies and voluntary organisations have to say about their flood response um, plans. Maybe I should just introduce myself. First of all, I'm Sue Matt Stevens. I am the, um, I'm your Police and Crime Commissioner for, for Aiden Somerset. And why this meeting is important, I think if you look back, the Somerset level saw the most significant flooding um, and uh, and although it can happen in other parts of the county, you know, it did hit uh, this area particularly badly. And during the flooding that I visited um, many of the areas affected and saw for myself the awful impact that it was having on, on your communities. I spoke to people affected both during that visit and afterwards, and they told me their stories and what they were going through. And, you know, individuals came and said to me about, you know, it's all very well for, te for, for the... Um, <coughs> messages to go out to go upstairs but that's not great if you're in a bungalow they were saying that when they had the message that they had to leave home the panic that ensured if you've got very young children or you have people you know uh, families with disabilities that that innate panic then of how you manage and you know <laughs> I, I, and I got that from you know many individuals who, who told me Anyone who, who lives or works in a flooded area will no doubt be anxious about the response they can expect this year if flooding happens again. And by telling you about the plans for in place, I hope that, that will, uh, you will increase your confidence in the plans and be reassured that they're in place. But first of all, I'd like to say that I'm <coughs> supremely aware that many of you are still being affected. I know that there are big issues about insurance and there are still rounds ongoing. I'm very, I'm very aware that there are building works still ongoing and that some of your, your homes are, are building sites or, um, and, um, and, and that is, uh, affects obviously your well-being. I'm also aware that some people are, are nowhere near back in their homes yet and that um, you have unhappy children, you have an unstable family life. And, and that lack of stability is not where any of us wanted anyone to be this far into uh, the, the autumn. So I understand the anxiety that you're feeling and you asked me to put to the agencies the questions, you know, how will the agencies learn and how will you know that the agencies have learned? So I felt strongly that the meeting was necessary to tell you about the plans. So with um, John of Somerset County Council and Leader, as you know, we wrote to them to outline a vision about what we wanted from this meeting. And the end result is that tonight we have this meeting and I'd like to thank the agencies who are here this evening for their participation. Not only will it benefit you, the local community, in hearing about the plans, but the agencies will be able to receive any feedback you might have and ensure that their plans are as resilient as they can be. So in a minute I will hand over to Councillor John Osman to say a few words and then there will be presentations from the Environment Agency, Somerset County Council, Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service, and Aiden and Somerset Constabulary, who will tell you about their plans. After that, we will conclude the formal presentations, and that we will then break for tea and coffee, and then you'll be able to come and talk to some of the agencies that are represented here, and that there are some also outside. And that many of us will be here until half past nine, so that you know you will have the opportunity to ask very specific questions about your specific issues that you need addressed. We, we, there's a lot to get through this evening and we'll be focusing on the response to the future and looking forward to what you can expect um, will happen if we have flooding. Um, and I think that it's important that rather than just have having a, a Q&A, what, we will, what we're going to have is that you come down and you talk about your individuals, individual issues rather than um, get bogged down in, in certain points of view from, uh, uh, um, the, in the, from the auditorium. 
But before we begin to look ahead to the flood response for this coming year, I just want to pay tribute to everyone that was involved in the devastating floods. Communities rallied round to support each other. The agencies involved worked hard doing their best to tackle the issue. And volunteers, some from considerable distances, came to the area to do their bit. And while there were lessons to be learned, and you'll hear about what's changed in a minute, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who helped this year. So in conclusion, thank you for coming, and I hope you find this an informative evening. Thank you. John? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome again to this uh, flooding uh, event. I'm John Osman, I'm uh, leader of Somerset County Council. Uh, first thank you to the Police Commissioner, thank you Sue for organising uh, this event this evening and getting everybody together to, to hear about what happens next. Last winter's floods were exceptional and unprecedented. They left a lasting impression on the county's residents, local authorities, emergency services and all organisations involved in flooding and water management. Every organisation here would, I'm sure, want to use this occasion to once again express their sympathies to everyone who suffered in last winter's floods and give thanks for the incredible community and voluntary response during the flooding and the recovery. Everyone involved this evening would love to say that flooding won't happen again. But that isn't something that anyone in this room or anywhere else can promise. But what we can all say is that there's been a huge amount of work since the winter to reduce the likelihood of flooding and reduce its duration and impact if it does happen again. In a very short space of time, the Flood Action Plan was produced and is already delivering multi-million pound projects such as at Beer Wall, where we're digging new culverts under the A372 to allow water to flow away quicker and keep the road open. At Muchony, where we are raising the road by 1.27 metres to ensure that if we have the same level of flooding again, the village won't be cut off. Across the county, the county council are engaged in deep cleaning of ditches and drainage channels. I wish to say thank you to our partners, such as the Environment Agency. Just last week, they completed their eight kilometres of dredging on the Parrot and Tone. They produced really helpful documentation, which I hope they talk about tonight, in relation to trigger points so you know what to expect and when should the rain fall. I'm really proud of the work of the internal drainage boards. They have led the implementation of many projects, amongst them the Thorny Ring Bank, which will hopefully protect residents there. Under the Flood Action Plan, we are in the process of setting up the Somerset Rivers Authority, which will be a key player in flood management in years to come. The setting up of the authority is progressing, and a series of papers are due to be made public this week, and we will ask for you to comment upon those. The key issue surrounding the creation of the Rivers Authority is how it will be funded. We need central government funding, interim funding of 2.7 million for the financial year 2015 and 2016, and I'm continuing to lobby with partners to get government to provide this. But following that, we need a mechanism to allow for year-on-year -year funding from central government, so they need to actually bring in legislation to allow us to do this. If we don't have the interim funding, if we don't have a mechanism to bring in future flooding, then all the good work which we've done in the last six months will be, I'm sorry to say, um, may not be able to be sustained. Somerset residents, compared to other residents in the country, other residents in other counties and other cities, in my view, have had a poor deal from central government, and I don't mind saying that. We get less funding for our councils, we get less funding for our education, and we have, of course, had less funding over the years to protect our natural environment and our communities. This must change. You deserve to be treated fairly, along with every other resident of this country, and I and all the partners will continue to fight your corner. You'll be able to find out more about the Flood Action Plan this evening, but the focus of today's presentations will be on how agencies have been working to improve their response to a flood incident. None of the organisations is responsible for responding to emergencies on their own. We work together, and one of the legacies of last year's crisis was seeing a renewed emphasis on how close cross-agency planning and working
can take place and has taken place. We all desperately hope that major flooding won't happen again, but preparing for the eventuality is something that can only be done with communities at the centre. Knowing what to expect from the district councils, the county council, the environment agency, drainage boards, emergency services and the volunteer sector is vital. Community flood plans are a vital part of this jigsaw. The civil contingency unit are here this evening and can help you produce plans if your community does not have one. And I'd ask you to go and have a word with them. Thank you again for coming this evening and for listening to the presentations. I hope you find it an enjoyable and informative evening. Thank you. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rachel Burden from the Environment Agency. Um, my job is to deliver the Environment Agency's contribution to the Somerset Levels and Walls Flood Action Plan. So primarily making sure we get the most out of the death of 10 million that came in this winter. Since the devastating floods of last winter, you will, you will have seen that the Agency has been busy out across the Somerset Levels and Walls, but also in other communities that were flooded last winter. To reiterate the messages that have gone before, we know and understand that many of you are still suffering from the after effects of the flooding and will do so for some time to come. We know that many of you still haven't moved back into your homes or some have only just moving back into your homes and that's very important to us. We have listened and spoken to a lot of people over the last 10 months and <clears throat> From that, here are the main concerns that we've picked up and have addressed over the summer. For many of you that experienced flooding, things were made worse by the feeling of not knowing what the authorities were doing on the ground. Many felt that we needed to tell you more during the event, that we needed to be more transparent. We needed to tell you what we were doing, when, why and how. A feeling amongst communities and organisations that perhaps more could have been done. A feeling that we needed to pump earlier and we needed to bring in more portable pumps. A cry for us to dredge the rivers. And understandably so, you must not never let this happen again. So we've listened to the messages that you fed back to us. This evening we hope to provide you with some reassurance that we've acted upon your concerns. That the work we have completed this summer will make a difference this winter, will make us better prepared. We'll show to you that we have an emergency response plan should we unfortunately see further flooding this winter. Like John said, we can never guarantee that flooding won't happen again, but I'm hoping what I share with you now will give you some comfort as we head towards the winter. One of the key pieces of work that we've completed over the summer months is the trigger point work. A lot of people have said that we don't know what the Environment Agency were doing last winter, when they were doing it and why. Why did you operate such and such a pumping station at such and such a time? Why didn't you bring pumps in earlier? Why wasn't that pumping station on? We've listened to that and hence the trigger point work has been delivered by my colleague in the front row, John Rowlands. It's about telling communities when, why and how we make the operational decisions that we do. It's about explaining to communities and to partners what, about what you will see on the ground. It also explains what difference you will see this winter compared to next winter. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. It should also give the communities the reassurance that the Environment Agency does have an emergency response plan in place if we should have another extreme event this winter or in future winters to come. It would also help other agencies plan their emergency response and importantly make sure that all, all the agencies are joined up and coordinated in their response. The trigger point documents that we've produced for 10 sites were agreed in scope of partners they're for key locations which had the, were the highlight of last winter's flooding. For example, eight pumping stations, including Northmore, Currymore, Saltmore and Western Zoyland. Also about how we'll use the Sowie and when we'll use the Sowie and when we'll put in pumps at Dunmore. There's no way I can do this piece of work any justice this evening in just one slide. So my colleague John is happy to talk to you afterwards about the detail. We are rolling it out to partners, we have rolled out to partners, apologies, we're now rolling it out to the wider community. So we're here tonight to explain more the detail about the 
But importantly, it will make a difference to you. It should give you the confidence as we go into winter. One of the key differences which the agency have made a commitment to do is to bring in more pumps, portable temporary pumps, earlier and in one go. Assuming that the triggers that are shown on this screen are met. So when roads start to flood, when there's a forecast over the next three to five days of 100 mil plus of rainfall, and when the levels on the moors are rising, are rising at a rate of five centimetres or more, at eight of our pumping stations, we will be bringing in temporary pumps in one go to, to equal or exceed the, capacity, the, the pump, additional pump capacity that we had last winter. That should give you the confidence that we've made a change. To set that into context, on North Walsh, which I know is dear to many of your hearts, as soon as, soon as New Road starts to flood, uh, New Road between North Curry and West Ling, then we will start to bring in the pumps at North Hall in one go. And to make that more efficient and effective, we've put in place the infrastructure, infrastructure this summer to accommodate those. Another example would be the Sowie. We won't use the, the, the Sowie Kingstead Hall drain system um, and open amongst these clice fully until the pumps are in at Dunwall. And again, we've done some works there this summer, which I go on to talk about. In order for us to confidently implement the triggers, bring in the pumps, pump earlier, etc., we've had to deliver some of the action on the ground from the death of 10 million. One of our key deliverables has been the 8 kilometre dredge, which we completed last week. Within eight weeks of the, the funding commitment, we started on site, starting very slowly and ramping up to allow ground conditions to allow us to work safely. We've delivered that successfully, um, removing 130,000 cubic metres of material and protecting, providing greater flood protection to the communities of North Moor, Curry Moor, the A361 and associated infrastructure. We listened to the communities after last winter's flooding and we made sure we had a single point of contact on the ground where if you had concerns about progress, if you had questions about road closures, we had a single point of contact that you could talk to. We held drop-ins every Wednesday afternoon. Those have been very successful and appreciated within the community. It was important to us to open Somerset for business and to support that. By doing that, we've wherever possible supported local, local suppliers in the dredge project and over 50% of the workforce came from local contractors. Further achievements which will allow us to more effectively implement the trigger levels that I've talked about are as follows. In order to utilise the salary system like we did last winter, we need to make sure that we have the pump facilities available at Dunmore. We've just completed a piled pump platform if, God forbid, we needed to bring the pumps in tomorrow, we have a safe place to put those pumps. If we're going to use that system, like we used it last winter, we need to make sure that the communities along the, the Sowie King Sedgemoor system are protected. That the, the mitigation for that is to provide um, the Allardro Flood Protection Scheme, which we've delivered, um, delivered in the last couple of months, and in fact will be completed this week. We're also in the process of putting in permanent defences around Graves Avenue and Western Zoyland. Temporary defences were deployed last winter, we're now making those permanent, giving that community the confidence that if we use that system, they have their own defences. We've made pumping station improvements at Northmore and Saltmore, to name two, where we can now bring in pumps more rapidly and more quickly for winter. We've carried out an extensive programme of asset repairs, making sure that Pumping stations, spillways, river banks, etc., are all back up to their pre flood condition. Many of our assets were damaged by the devastating floods. We've also been looking at where would we dredge next. Uh, the Somerset Partners have attracted local growth funding of two, million, of 2 million over the next couple of years. Where is the best place to spend that? Where has the biggest hydraulic physical benefit? So we have those 10 locations delivering at the moment the results. We're working with the drainage board to work out where the Somerset Partners will spend that money next year. So you will see some additional dredging next year. We are also looking at the SAWI system. What improvements do we need to make to the SAWI system going forward? 
Again, local growth funding, Somerset Partners have attracted eight million, a one-off opportunity to do something special in that system to complement the works that Somerset County Council are already doing at Beer Wall, so that if we need to use that system, like we used it last winter, to alleviate pressure on the power at home, we can do so. So all of these actions basically give us the confidence to implement the trigger levels I've spoken about. We've also listened to you about improving our communications, being more transparent, telling people what, what, when and how we are making decisions during an event. We've put a huge effort into social media. I appreciate it's only one channel of communication, but it's a, ch a channel of communication that suits money. But we also need to complement that with other means, such as briefing notes, drop-ins, etc. We're using the village agents wherever ever possible to cascade information. We're using uh, district and county councillors where possible, also on partner organisations and parish councils. Like I've said, for the dredging drop-in, we had specific drop-ins every Wednesday afternoon, and we plan to do similar events for the SAWI as the SAWI scheme gets going. <coughs> We've also listened to people's views that you need simple graphics and here you can see what we call our dredgeometer. What progress are you making? What are your milestones? When are you going to deliver the project? How many teams have you got working on site? This is a very simple way of showing people the progress we're making week on week. So this came out every Friday afternoon in a briefing note. It kept the communities involved. It showed that we were taking action to prepare for winter. John's already referred very briefly to community flood plans. We're working closely with Sunset County Council as part of the flood action plan with local communities that were affected, um, were affected the work last winter. Del delivering flood plans which will make communities more resilient but also will have single points of contact which will help organisations this winter identify how to get information out into the community. This is very much a two-way communication, two communication process. The other thing we're thinking about doing this winter, and we'd like to roll it out wider with our partner organisations, is that if we should go into an event, we'd like to have community-based representatives, so that you have a single point of contact in any one community from the Environment Agency and all the other organisations that could be on site working with you as the flood is developing, saying what we're doing, when, why and how. Again, I hope you'll see that as a positive response to preparing for winter. Working with partners, uh, we're an active partner on the Flood Action Plan and it gives me great comfort to think that this winter the multi-organisational response will be slicker. We are working together, we know what each other are doing, uh, we know how to go forward. We're also working with the military to have a joined up response plan. When do we bring them in? What could we use them for? How could they complement our existing operational stuff on the ground? What could they do for us? They're very useful to us last winter. <coughs> Just one example, when our, when our pumping stations were totally surrounded by water, they were bringing in fuel to keep those pumps going. <coughs> We've also been working with the LRF to review lessons learned from the operations of bronze, silver and gold and fielding into the reports that are coming out. I'm sure we'll hear about, more about that this evening. So although I cannot guarantee flooding will never happen again, I feel that the Environment Agency are better prepared for winter. The additional 10 million has made a huge difference. You've seen the action on the ground, you've seen how that will allow us now to implement trigger levels, bringing pumps earlier and quicker. We have a clear emergency response plan and we're working very closely with our partners in Somerset. I think everybody in this room would acknowledge there is still lots to do and we need to keep that momentum going. We need to rebuild the confidence in the community and we need to continue to make a difference on the ground. I've only given you a few snippets of the work we've been doing this week, this, over this summer with the project teams up in the front row are here this evening to talk to you and take your questions. And we're happy to come out and work with you in the community as and when um, the requests come to us. Thank you.
you mind if I take my jacket off? Because these lights are really good at that. <coughs> my name is Simon Clifford, Somerset County Council. Uh, just one quick announcement. You'll see that uh, we've got a photographer and we've got a, a film crew here. I'm calling you a film crew, so it's two guys. Uh, so this is going to be uh, yeah, available uh, as a recording put on the Police and Crime Commissioner's YouTube site uh, in a couple of days' time. So if you want to see, uh, get some uh, more feedback and listen again to, uh, to what you've heard, uh, go to YouTube, search for David Somerset Police and Crime Commissioner, uh, and you'll find this in possibly two days' time. Two days' time. Uh, so it's good to see so many friendly faces and people that, uh, that I've seen and, uh, and we've been talking to over the past well, months and months and months. Uh, I've chatted earlier to Charles from Boroughbridge, I see that uh, David also from Boroughbridge there, Alastair earlier on from Munchorne, uh, Catherine for the fact with the fantastic village agents, Rick, there's district councillors, parish councillors, county councillors all here today, uh, all here to uh, take your questions and try to help where we can but also to, to listen again to you, which is a theme that we've had coming through the past months and uh, uh, the last six, six or eight months or so. Learning from you, because let's face it, we got a lot of things right, we got a lot of things wrong. And I think we just need to be upfront and acknowledge that right at the beginning. So this is about acknowledging what we got right and putting right what we got wrong. Um, so thanks to you all for coming. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat the thanks you've had already, other than to say that it's really good to see that contributions are being recognised. I was at a fantastic uh, Chairman's Awards evening uh, a couple of weeks ago where local people involved in the campaigns, and particularly in the flag campaign, uh, were acknowledged for the huge effort that they put in uh, to get uh, that massive online Facebook presence up and running and what a success it was. And national recognition too, again through flag, but there's no reason why other parts of the community shouldn't be acknowledged as being highly successful, because that's what they are. It's been a tremendous issue, a tremendous asset to, to the communities. Uh, have people here, did people here come and take part in the audience at the BBC Floods debate? Just a, a mutter of yay or nay? No. no? <coughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was okay as an event. It, well, the BBC put out a general invite. This is run by the BBC, obviously not by anyone here. Uh, but the BBC put, out, put this flight event on and they had rolling pictures all the way through. Uh, and I was sitting next to uh, one flag member uh, who recognised their own home as being deep, uh, underwater. And uh, uh, I looked across at her and she didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Laugh that it's being used as an example of how bad it was or cry because she saw what the state of the house was in. <coughs> so I'm, I'm, an apology here, if anyone does recognise their homes, so it's, it's, uh, it's uh, unfortunate and I do apologise, but it's, it's important to set the context for what we're talking about, which is very severe flooding. Um, you heard the word earlier on, unprecedented, I'm going to use it two or three times, so let me just get the facts and figures. An unprecedented flood event, one in 250 years. The year before, an unprecedented flood event, one in 100 years. When last December started and went into January and February, it moved from being a two in 100 years to a one in 250 years. It was just a remarkable rain event. It just would not stop raining from middle of December through to the end of February, beginning of March. There were just two days in Somerset where it didn't rain. Two days in two and a half months. One of those days, Prince Charles came. Remarkable time on his behalf. He's, uh, he can certainly bring sunshine with him as well as many other things. Uh, unprecedented length of time that we had uh, a major incident declared. 82 days, the longest in our history. An unprecedented volunteer effort. Hundreds and hundreds of people stepping up. Thousands and thousands of people across the country responding with offers of help. And I had a shift down at our Borough Bridge Help Centre and in one morning alone I took calls from a London diving company offering something like £15,000 worth of diving equipment, uh, a Devon couple who offered a holiday caravan, uh, numerous people offering to come down for a weekend and offer to help clean up, a scout group asking where to send donations and umpteen, and I mean umpteen people turning up and saying what can I do to help. It really was remarkable, and tonight is about what was done, what is being, being done, and what will be different for future flooding events. 
You all know what happened. Uh, the rain started at the end of December, and the first of the significant uh, flooding events happened in, in Thorny. It actually started on the coastline, but it moved on to Thorny relatively quickly. Much of was then cut off, and a uh, decision was taken by the county council with our district partners. And when I say councils, these are the five district councils and some of the county council who pretty much worked consistently all the way through together in a partnership. So in much of we provided uh, a humanitarian support boat when even the tractors couldn't get through. Uh, and we made a, a lot of use of our civil contingencies unit. Now, that, that sounds a bit jargony. In old money, that would have been called the emergency planning team. Again, a partnership with all the district councils, very effective and operates out of County Hall, but is a big partnership. Uh, making sure that everyone in various dis affected districts knew what was going on and what we had to do to help. It quickly became clear it wasn't normal flooding. Uh, and when we realised this, things had to change. Somerset County Council committed a million pounds almost immediately towards dredging and to our uh, very successful flood mitigation fund, which helps communities with small scale flood alleviation projects. So alongside the initial response, we're already looking to the future on what more we could be doing to help prevent this happening again. You've seen these pictures before, but you know, it never, it never, I'm never tired of looking at it. It's just a remarkable event. These were the pictures that were beamed into every household in the country for what seemed like weeks on end. Uh, this is a slightly personal view on this, so if I could slightly step away from here so it's not a county council view, it's my view. I believe there were positives and negatives to this. The positives, images like this, revealed the scale and the scope of what Somerset was dealing with. It was beyond small local authorities. This had to be a big joined up effort to, do, to make a difference. It grabbed the national attention, which was great. From that, it grabbed the political attention. I'm not at all being cynical there. It's un inevitable that the politicians were going to get involved once we had Sky, BBC, ITV, international media turning up and rolling news running for 24 hours. Visits came from the highest level, as you can see. Uh, it sparked a huge appeal and a huge response, response from the public. It br brought Prince Charles to the area, we discussed, and the image of the royal throne being carried on a tractor trailer is one that will live long in many people's minds. Uh, and it did contribute to funding for major investments. Quotes from the Prime Minister, such as, this must never happen again, and money is no object. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're so naughty. Uh, negatives. There were negatives to this coverage. Uh, in quotes, only, only 3% of Somerset was flooding. But you don't get that from that image being broadcast in a, on national media or on a, um, a national newspaper. So only some 3% of Somerset was flooded, but the general population of England thought that Somerset was closed to business. Uh, it was reported that up to 40% drop in holiday bookings, for instance, uh, had a dramatic impact on an important part of our rural economy. <coughs> I feel there was also a feeling that with all this money being um, thrown at, uh, at Somerset and the levels, that it would lead to a feeling there would be no further flooding on levels. And we've had a very clear explanation from, uh, from Rachel here that that's not what this is about. It's about mitigating what flooding does, does happen. Everyone in this room knows that we can't stop and we can't promise flooding, but there's a lot of work taking place to reduce the duration, the depth, the frequency of extreme flooding. And that's been led through the 20-year flood action plan, and if not the architect, certainly the linchpin is sitting over there, Sarah Diakono, who's available to take questions later. And that was a fantastic effort to get a plan that will last us for 20 years on a Secretary of State's table in six weeks was a terrific effort again with huge input from a, a wide variety of partners. The other thing about the publicity is that massive publicity always, and I mean always, leads to a sharp feeling of loss when it's disappeared from TV, from radio and from newspapers. There is an impact on individuals and on entire communities that they have been forgotten. That's the nature of national media. It is a insatiable beast that moves on to the next story, and I know because I used to be part of it. With public interest failing, 
Political interest can also disappear quickly, and money promised might sometimes dry up. And I'll talk about what we're going to be doing a little uh, later about what we're hoping to do to prevent that. Again, an important part of looking to the future. So the County Council and District Councils run a huge range of services anyway, but the flood put massive pressure on them. As we poured people in to help them through, throughout the flooding, we were leaving our day jobs behind and then had to try to pick them up again. So every, every part of the council was being stretched. Somerset County Council's own priority is to identify, support and help vulnerable people. That's children, elderly people, people with disabilities, uh, anyone that we know about who needs, uh, needs help and support and try to find those who we don't know about. For instance, a family may be caring for a vulnerable person uh, themselves. Uh, they may not be using social services, but when you need to relocate from uh, a flooding house to somewhere else, there are obvious difficulties in relocating to suitable adapted buildings, and that's where the council needs to step in. So our priority is for the protection of life and helping vulnerable. That's our ultimate responsibility. But communities, quite rightly, expect more from us and from the rest of the public sector. So we work closely with all the partners that are here and in the foyer. Uh, emergency services, health sector, local authorities, voluntary and charity groups uh, to help where we can and as much as we can. That's what we've been doing since the flooding, working together to improve. And you can see some of the impacts, the obvious impacts that came our way through the course of the flooding up on the slide now. <coughs> Uh, obviously, transport uh, and highways was a huge factor. Uh, many people might not have been directly affected by flooding, but they were certainly affected by major roads being flooded. Uh, long diversion routes, more petrol being burned, how to get your kids to school without doing a 30 mile round trip. There are enormous uh, <coughs> issues for many people, and some of them were significant issues as well. The support boat we provided at Munchen is a good example of how decisions are made and it was an evolving situation throughout the course of these floods. Uh, the boat that you see there was provided through SCC, but it was the Wheelie Boat Trust uh, and the Monsal Lock Canal Centre who provided it and we're extremely grateful for that. Uh, the fire service manned it and we were grateful for that. It was a great team effort uh, to help a, a, a cut off community not not survive, but, but do the best that we could under the circumstances they were in. Uh, we've already talked about, should this happen again, what would we do? And we are able to react far faster, more quickly on getting boats and other emergency equipment uh, supplied if needed. Uh, there's always that caveat that if needed. And I saw others saying, is that enough? Well, we shall see. We're raising the road there, uh, but just in case, we have the fallback position. So hopefully we'll be able to provide at least a bare minimum service for those communities. We need to have good communication links. Rachel mentioned communication. Frankly, the number of times I hear people say communication is key, uh, is, is interminable. But it is true. You need to have good communications with our community leaders to help with people's needs. We have made the link with people who can help uh, in the heart of communities. And in one ex uh, example, again, and much more, uh, we linked up with a company to provide heating oil. We liaised with the ambulance service to make sure they had plans in place to assist in the case of an emergency, and we had use of those plans. Uh, we kept in regular contact to see if there was anything else we could do to help. One local business was kept going, it thought it was going to go bust, it was kept going by the provision of a, a 4 by 4 uh, This was a deal that was uh, initiated, uh, and hands were shaken over a couple of pints in a pub. It was amazing, just talking to people, you can find people willing to help and step in. That offer has potentially saved that business. It was a fantastic offer. So there was a huge amount going on, but sometimes the flooded communities didn't always see it, and that was our fault. A big lesson we've learned was about getting out and being visible, talking to people and letting them know that we are working on their behalf, and to make our efforts more obvious and more successful. So we've changed our planning to reflect the need so that next time this happens, you will see what's happening and what support you're being offered. It won't be invisible. We know, and I said right at the beginning, I was very upfront, we know we did not do everything as well as we would have liked. We know that. Yeah. We have definitely changed, and a lot we will do in the future will be a lot better, and we will build on what we have learned. We know it's important that key individuals in communities and organisations 
have an early discussion to understand what we need to do and how. We had great feedback from the community event in Overy this summer. We know that being on the ground to support our communities and our volunteers was valuable and that's what we will do again. We know that having someone on the ground gives really good intelligence and information that we can then act on. Having identified community representatives was incredibly useful and means we can do things we know have a positive impact for people in that area. Again, people are like the local community representatives, uh, the village agents were worth their weight in gold for the help they gave us. County and district councils, we do talk to each other. I know it sometimes doesn't look like we do, and sometimes that it's more awkward than it needs to be, but we do talk to each other, honestly. We learn lessons together and we improve together. That will continue. <coughs> so we'll be more visible, we'll be more on the ground, and more on that in a minute. We're moving also towards uh, a single phone number for Somerset County Council. Not exactly a floodline, but eventually, before too long, we'll have Somerset County Council, instead of having the 12 numbers that are currently in use, we'll have a single number. And that you can imagine how helpful that is going to be when we want to promote way we need to get through a single number. It's, it's not a single, it's a single number, although we'll have the same number of lines. So, in, in, I understand it, and maybe I'll, I uh, didn't explain that clearly. We're going to move from an 0845 number to an 0300 number, and that number will then uh, uh, do all the work that the 0845 number does. And the side benefit of that is means that it can then be used in call plans and will be free to many customers. So, it's not a single phone number, it's a, a single number that we will use to promote what we do. Uh, thank you for the interruption. I do understand that. Yeah. Uh, you've heard the Environment Agency's plans for the future, uh, and I've mentioned again the Flood Action Plan, which has major investment from the government. Uh, we will continue, though, to fight for more investment. Many people are not in their homes, as, as Sue Mount Stevens was saying. Uh, we are funding the volunteer effort to bring this about as smooth as we can, and that's where we have to pay tribute to the uh, SEV, all the red t-shirts at the back, for the fantastic efforts that they're putting in. There are pots of money available and we will continue to fight for more. It takes a long, long time to fully recover from a flooding event. We are here and we are in it for the long term. So tonight we've got representatives from the Flood Action Plan uh, for you to take your questions. Uh, sometimes councils and partners get criticised, and quite fairly, for the lack of urgency. <coughs> Uh, this flood action plan, as I said earlier, delivered from scratch within six weeks, was a superb effort. Please take the time to go and speak to the, uh, the team there uh, and ask questions where you need. We've also got people from our highways team here uh, who will be able to take your questions. Uh, the Sunset Waste Partnership are here. The Civil Contingency uh, Partnership with our district councils, they're here. And from Sunset County Council, our on-the-ground response team and communications team are here to listen to learn and to change where we need to. We, again, we are going to use this event as an opportunity to listen to you and bring about improvements where you think they're needed. Two-way communication, as Rachel was saying, is incredibly important. Uh, one example in Martok uh, is something that I'd like other parishes to think about and see if they can help. It's a very innovative and exciting community development plan there. Uh, at one stage, during the flooding event, the best road closure information came from Martok's own network of contacts, and that's something we want to tap into, it's a really good thing. So Martok Parish are going to give us daily updates, should we into a flooding event again, in order to give us the best information we can, and we'd encourage other par parishes wanting to join in to come and do that, and come and talk to our highways team. Close to the ground, accurate, up-to-date information is vital, uh, and we will have a toolkit for communities to help us help them. We're talking to your communities about various projects, including one, I think the first meetings are tomorrow, uh, about sandbag stalls at key locations uh, in the heart of the community. We currently have 25,000 sandbags ready to be, be deployed. We did think about bringing them here so you could take a couple home each, but thought that might be asking a bit much. We are ready to react quickly. Uh, we set up our Borough Bridge Help Centre uh, with connectivity and staffing in three days and pat ourselves on the back thinking that was good until we thought actually that took three days 
to get it up and running. That's not good enough. So we will challenge ourselves, if needed, to get a similar um, uh, help centre up and running within 24 hours. And to wrap up before uh, uh, police and fire take over, Yes, we could have done better, but the key is, have we learned and will we improve? I hope that the answer to, to both those questions is yes, uh, and I hope you'll appreciate that. We will get on the ground faster and provide the help you need more quickly. We will make it simpler for residents, businesses and communities to contact us, to talk to us and to get the response they need. We will be more geared up to respond to specific local issues. We will help communities to be more able to help themselves. And importantly, I just want to reference back to something that uh, Councillor Rosman said right at the beginning. We will continue to fight to keep the government honest, to convert their words and the words in the flood action plan that they have signed up to, to be converted into real action. In particular, we will continue the fight for a barrage or sluice and to secure the interim and long-term funding requirements for the Somerset Rivers Authority. As John said, and I'm quoting him, he said, you deserve it and we'll do everything we can to deliver it. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Lee Howell. I'm the Chief Fire and Rescue uh, Advisor for Wales, but I'm here uh, tonight in my role as Chief Fire Officer for <coughs> Devon and Somerset. Um, and I think it would be remiss of me not to uh, express those sincere um, condolences to those that were still uh, affected by the significant flooding. Uh, and I know it's something that you're, you're still continuing to live with. Uh, and it does affect emergency services, it does affect all the agencies. So, um, you know, at the outset, you know, this is about us um, explaining what it is that we do and what lessons we've learned. But at the same time, we do try our best. And sometimes that's good enough, uh, and sometimes uh, we have more to do. Uh, but I think it's important that we recognise it. So, um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the work of the Fire and Rescue Service um, and our strategic intent is to uh, protect life and property, your life and your property. Um, and the ways um, in which um, we, uh, we do this is our focus on prevention uh, characterises everything that we do and so wherever possible we try and provide as much support uh, to allow uh, communities, individuals to be resilient before uh, flooding events. So that work that we're doing through village agents and uh, our community resilience in Somerset uh, project is absolutely key to, uh, to us being able to do that. Uh, we've also got flood advice information on our website, increasingly we're in a digital age, uh, and, and that's useful. Um, but also we provide a phased response with resources that are scaled up uh, and uh, will be directly linked to the trigger events that Ron AMC mentioned earlier. So that was something that wasn't in place uh, previously, and it's, uh, it's something that we have uh, learned from. In terms of um, what we've got available to us, well, clearly uh, a number of people in this room were very complimentary about the uh, the way in which we provided some of our uh, some of our resources and. And it's, it's very, um, it's unusual with an incident that is so extended uh, because the Fire and Rescue Service, we, we're in very quickly, we deal with the incident at the very early stages. And historically, we then extract ourselves because our job is done. What we found was that we um, didn't, we had skills and we didn't want to extract ourselves from a situation that was an extended period of difficulty for so many people. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, the contribution that, that we can make, and I'll expand on it in, in a little bit, um, is, uh, I think, is significant. And it's over and above what, what is uh, would reasonably be expected. But I think every single organisation, if you've got skills and resources available, 
you want to work collectively to try and protect the community. So this isn't about individual agencies. And the strength that's emerged from this, because there always has to be something positive that comes from something so, so difficult, is that you've got a number of partners um, at the table now and, uh, and in the auditorium that work in much, much more closely together. Um, but in terms of uh, what we've got, uh, within Devon and Sunset alone, we've got four pound rescue boats, we've got high volume pumps, which you would have seen. Um, we deploy supervisory officers as well as specialist tactical advisors, less so in flood waters, but uh, our specialist advisors are, uh, are experts in, uh, in swift water rescue, etc. So um, less, of a, less of an issue in a, in a flooding environment, but their, their skills are, are absolutely uh, second to none. And working closely with the environment agency, actually, we we, we did some some very good work. I thought um, during uh, during that incident, um, we also have assets available for neighbouring fire services uh, and uh, and additional boats and high volume pumping appliances from uh, uh, national mutual aid arrangements. Um, and again, it's probably something that I'll, I'll share with you, which uh, was a frustration from me at the time. It was a frustration that. That, that I had or we had with Environment Agency um, links to uh, we had a lot of high volume pumps that we didn't really, we didn't uh, feel were being deployed effectively. Uh, now we talk about litres per minute is our is our measurement. The Environment Agency talked about cubic metres per second. So once I realised, once we realised the scale of what the Environment Agency could, environment agency could bring to bear. Actually, I now completely understood the reason why the, uh, the, the pumping appliances that we had weren't needed and they, they weren't, weren't significant enough to deal with the issue in, in front of us. So there's a certain amount of learning about each other that we didn't have prior to that event. We certainly have it now. Um, what, um, what you can expect from us? Well, clearly we provide uh, advice with, with leaflets and not just about um, pumping, but, but simple things like uh, uh, pumping out of flood water and the dangers of carbon monoxide. Um, you know, there are experiences in, in other parts of the, the, uh, the UK where, where people have died as a result of pumping out flood water from, from basements, etc., and being overcome by carbon monoxide. So it's not just about dealing with the, the immediate risk, i.e., the, the, the flood water. It's about some of the secondary risks that we have a, a, a focus on, and we want to help you, help yourselves, and, and, and work uh, together to, for, for our own, own benefit. One of the things that we, uh, we also did, um, we uh, did some, uh, some excellent work, and it was very well received at the time, um, with our service colleagues, door-to-door um, -door assessments, medical and fire risk assessments of individual um, properties. And it wasn't just about that medical, that fire risk assessment. It was that contact that was so important, certainly in those early stages. It was the fact that there was somebody that would at least be able to refer a, an issue on to another agency. Uh, people knew that it wasn't an issue that the fire service or the ambulance service could resolve. That wasn't important. What they expected, quite rightly, is that you were there to help, and the issue that they needed help with, you needed help with, um, needed to be dealt with by someone and so what we were able to do is act as a bit of a conduit because we were actually on the ground at the time and that was something that worked, uh, worked uh, very well and we will do that again, we will continue to do that again. Um, clearly uh, in terms of rescuing people from homes, uh, if they're uh, unable to escape unaided, you would expect us to do that and, and we did that and we, we will continue to do that. And, uh, and additionally in terms of pumping large volumes of water, well, that, well that's fine. Um, but as Simon said earlier, there was an awful lot of water, and it kept coming, and it kept coming. And, um, and the problem is with water, as you're well aware, there's no point in pumping it if it's just going to come back to where you've just pumped it from. So uh, we, were, we were limited by some of the environmental factors, um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, when, uh, when we did need to, to start moving a lot of water, it did, it did shift quite quickly. In addition, uh, what, uh, what we did that was uh, unusual for us, because bear in mind this was an unusual event for us, it was an unusual event for, for any fire rescue service, we were able with the support of, um, of, a, of a number of people, uh, we were able to forward deploy firefighting kit and equipment. 
so that all we needed to worry about was getting people to the kits, because a kit was already where it needed to be. Uh, and that was the easy bit, whether we needed uh, uh, helicopters or however we needed to get there, um, we could get people to kit, even if uh, the access was, uh, was, was uh, compromised. And that required some different thinking and some different planning and some different assumptions. Uh, and again, we're more prepared now. I think we did well, and actually at the time, there were a lot of people that were um, heaping a lot of praise onto um, uh, a lot of people that were involved, certainly in the early stages. And I think, understandably, as the incident went on and things took a while to resolve, those frustrations started to, to come in. But I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that actually um, we could have done more, we could have done things differently, we could have done things better, we'd be better prepared next time. But we did some good stuff, um, and I'm, I'm quite proud of quite proud of that. But you know, very keen to, to learn. And if you've got direct feedback, please, please let me have it. I'll be I'll be well, I'll welcome it. Um, also, working uh, using our uh, our fire stations as uh, points of um, um, gathering um, rendezvous points. Uh, these are community buildings. They belong to you. They belong to us. They belong to all of us. Um, they don't belong to any one agency. And so. Uh, mapping where those fire stations are and allowing uh, other people to use them, voluntary groups, etc., to use them to actually um, use that as a base for, for a response was something that worked quite well, and we would clearly do that um, uh, in, in the future. And providing advice and responding to all home, road, and business users as well. Again, you would expect us to do that, and rightly so. Um, it's just a leaf that I, I referred to earlier. Um, the, um, what we can also do, uh, and, and again Simon, uh, I was pleased Simon mentioned it, uh, we had a lot of off-duty firefighters that travelled up primarily from Exmouth to come up and crew the, the boat to Muxham. And um, again, completely outside of uh, anything we would normally do, but that gave us a tremendous opportunity to talk to people and to get a real in-depth sense of feeling and understanding of what it must have been like, what it was like. Uh, and, and that's useful for us because we, we don't just respond to emergencies, we need to understand how we can work better with communities to try and um, change that, uh, that, that response in the future. And that gives a tremendous opportunity to, to get that direct feedback. Uh, one of the other things as well that, that, that we did, and you would have seen firefighters going around with wading sticks and marking lampposts and, and, other, and other structures as, as we, as we made, made progress. What that was about wasn't to protect our fire engines or our firefighters, it was so that other 4x4 vehicle users could see the depth of the water and then they knew whether or not they could uh, gain access or not. So it's very much a case of providing a contribution that helps that infrastructure continue to work. Now, in the early early stages, the water level was, was up here, it was higher than that in some places, you, you were aware. But actually, as that receded, that then gave a degree of confidence that people could actually make, make progress through through some of that flood water. Uh, and, and again, that was something that we didn't foresee, uh, but it was something that needed doing, and we had some, some skills and capability to do that, and working with partners, we were able to respond and meet, uh, meet that need. We also used uh, our boats uh, to support police visibility. Um, Caroline, I don't know if you're going to cover uh, that, that, uh, that, that perception and that need for police visibility, so I won't go into too much detail, but actually we were able to just provide some, some, some boats to allow that to happen. Not because it was something that is part of what we would normally do, but at the same time it was meeting the need and, uh, and hopefully uh, that, was, um, that was well received. Um, so what have we done? Well, instead of working in a... The, the, the fire service is the same as the military in many respects. You have, a, you have a series of assets and you have training and people that deploy those assets based on the scenario in front of you. And it almost doesn't matter what that scenario is, you fix the problem with the assets that you've got available to you. So in terms of planning, we didn't have a site-specific flood plan for the Somerset levels. We do now. Because the scale and, the, and, 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 and dare I say it, it, you know, it's foreseeable that that could be another deployment for us. Hopefully in no way of that, that, that same, that same level. 
but um, but at the same time we now have a site specific for uh, we've got rendezvous points that are identified and, and, and pumping locations that are identified based on our experiences for, from uh, from last year so we're already two three steps further ahead than, than we were last year we've linked as I mentioned earlier that deployment to the environment agency trigger points so in terms of that scale of resourcing uh, and again as Rachel mentioned earlier uh, the mapping is, is quite clear to see. So based on different trigger points, we know what areas are likely to be flooded, and so we know we can map our resourcing and the rendezvous points to that. So that's part of our, uh, our planning assumption now. We've tested and exercised those plans, we've further enhanced our 4x4 capability. Um, we've had discussions with communities for two reasons, to outline what you can expect from us. Um, because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're here to help, you, know, you, you pay for us, we're, we're accountable to you and that's why so I, welcome, I welcome tonight's opportunity to, 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 to show what, uh, what we're about. But if, there are, if you are aware that there are skills and capability that we could deploy that would help solve a problem, just ask. Uh, unless there's a reason why you can't do it, we will, we will meet that need. We've also strengthened our arrangements with village agents and flood warnings and, and that strength in that uh, enhanced education and risk reduction work. Yeah, I'm, I'm great, thanks. Um, so in terms of the, um, uh, the site-specific plan uh, as, uh, as outlined, and this, uh, I'll leave you with this, uh, with this slide. Um, it's a bit of a busy slide, but in, in essence what, what it shows is that for different um, uh, environment agency trigger points, there are different resourcing levels and different responses that, that will be deployed to, to meet that need. So, in summary, I'm very proud of what we did and, and what my, my staff uh, did uh, last, uh, last year and, and I'm grateful to all those people that provided <coughs> messages of support and thanks. It does make a difference and it, and it does get to those that, that do, do the work on the ground. And we're going to continue to work with partners to deliver the very best service to you uh, before, during and, and after uh, times of need. So um, thanks very much. Hopefully we won't ever have to, uh, to, to deploy in the same way again, but if we do, we're in a much stronger position than we were last year. Caroline Peters and uh, at the time this major incident was declared I was the police guard commander in, in charge of the police operation. Uh, I was also then the chair of the uh, strategic coordinating group so uh, wore a couple of hats. Um, I'm going to try and wrap up as quickly as I can because a lot of, of good stuff has already been said but just wanted to just give you a quick overview of um, the police role really and what our police role is, is in an emergency. Um, a brief overview of the resources and the assets that were deployed, what has been done since the flooding and what we'll do differently uh, and what you can expect <coughs> from us. It's pretty much like the, uh, the fire service really. Um, our, our key aim is really just to protect life and property. Um, but also within a, multi, uh, a major incident, we have a, a further role to play, which is normally to coordinate uh, events and services and other agencies. Uh, and we, we set up uh, from a strategic group and to a tactical group. So the strategic, looking at what the aims and the priorities and the objectives are, what we need to achieve, and then the tactical and the operation of the doers. But what's already been shared already is the fact that it always is and always should be a shared approach. It's a joint approach uh, in, in dealing with anything like this. Uh, and I certainly think from a personal experience with the floods that we had, that relationship has grown even stronger. Just moving on to just to give you uh, some context to the assets and the resources that were deployed for the floods. That's already been said, it was over 82 days. Um, neighbourhood beat teams really were, were our lifeblood on the ground um, and I know many of you will have engaged with that frontline community engagement 
it was obviously a big feed for us around what was happening on the ground and some of the key messages that we needed to have to put out were done through the neighbourhood beat teams. And I think it's also a point to say that a number of these neighbourhood te beat teams were locals as well and a number of them had flooded premises but were coming in doing exceptionally long hours to try and make sure that we, we met the needs and try to alleviate some of the distress that was coming from this event. We also brought in um, other specialist uh, police services like the support group, so many of you would have seen the dive unit in particular that would have had that um, underwater gear ready, but they also used their boat for the transportation to allow people to get to places. We had the horses for high visibility and reassurance. We also had the police cadets out doing leaflet drops and newsletters, and we also had the special services of the special constables. We had community contact vehicles um, uh, that were out in strategic points, um, and we had mo the police mobile stations as well. Um, and I know that we, we tried to put them obviously in places where the most people could get to, to, to get information from. Uh, and it was also used as an opportunity as a tea stop, to be honest. <coughs> Members of the community, residents, in, in sort of quite often freezing cold, and, and certainly uh, for, for many people, just needed someone to talk to. It was very important for us. We then used additional things like Land Rovers for access to certain areas that we couldn't ordinarily get to. Uh, and to coordinate all the resources in the multi-agency, we used a coordination centre. So we used Taunton Police Station, also a part of that was actually mothballed. So we had to quickly reopen it, get everything working again. So there was a very big challenge in using the IT and getting that working up together. But we brought in the local communications team as well. So everything was on site so that from a geograph geographical point of view, we were there and we had a pretty prompt response from that centre. One thing that we did have, which we didn't anticipate, um, uh, but actually again from a personal view, was, was the real fear of crime. And to be honest, that took up uh, an, uh, an awful amount of time, and it was a real threat, an absolutely genuine real threat. threat. Um, so we came with the uh, important decision, we, we put out what are our barriers that we often use for um, training uh, to block off uh, and to support and close roads so that people did feel safe. It was incredibly important for residents that could get back into their houses to know that people weren't being tempted by criminality. But just from a reassurance point of view, in the flood affected areas this year, there was only 12 recorded crimes affected by the floods. So we, I would say, again, we, we say our thanks with the, with the teams on the ground. An awful lot of effort was done to try and keep your property safe and you safe. But that also included you as communities as well, as neighbours, as individuals, because you were our eyes and ears as well. And it was incredibly important that we, we had that there. But just to put it into context around the reality um, uh, uh, and the, the amount of recorded crime being comparable to the years before, in that same area there was 32 crimes the year before 31. So moving on to the, the important piece really is, is you know, what has been done um, since the flooding. Um, as police do, as with a number of uh, real life agencies, we love our debriefs. But there's a very, very important reason why we do this, because it's all about making sure that we're fit for purpose or we can be a lot better um, in responding to a similar situation. And it's about putting out an action plan and um, learning the lessons. Um, part of that, particularly with the Blue Light Services, and we've got colleagues from the South West Ambulance Service Trust here as well, is um, uh, the JESSIP programme. Um, I, I do apologise for the length of some of these words, but it's important to know how we work and how we train together. And it's the Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Programme. And it's, uh, the, the aim is just to work together in a more coordinated way uh, to save life. Um, and it's to train and exercise together at all levels of command so that we can respond to any major incident. With any major incident, it can be incredibly complex and understanding the threat and scale of such a major incident, particularly this one, I don't think anyone would have estimated that we would have gone on for 82 days. And I'm sure there's many of you at the first point in, in de late December said you will have to evacuate house would have said we're talking absolute nonsense. But that was the reality, and that's something that we had to deal with. 
um, and, and yourself. And of course, it, it caused a tremendous amount of distress and upset. But the, with the training and we coordinate with that, we've now got nationally 10,400 of our commanders that are now trained in this. And I think it really pulled through through our coordination centre because we knew and understood, understood each other's roles and responsibilities. But as far as the police are concerned about going forward, what we did is we, after the debriefs, and we had national debriefs, so we were looking at the bigger picture as well because we weren't the only area that was flooded. But there were the same key things that were coming out. And as a consequence, the Avon Somerset Local Resilience Forum um, were, had to look at it in particular uh, and to revise the framework of, of what we, we deal with. For these particular floods, there were a number of issues that we had to deal with. Ensuring public safety, maintaining essential services and infrastructure, protecting property, uh, providing advice and information, um, promoting self-help and recovery and restoring to, to normality. Uh, all this was involved, but we also used a much, much wider group of other agencies and support. Uh, and I know I'll miss them out, but they were as diverse as we had the NFU, we had animal welfare. Um, we had evacuation and shelter plans that we had to consider. An enormous amount of information and planning that we had to look at collectively to determine what was the most important priority and to deal with the biggest threat on an hourly basis, not just on a daily basis. We've also revised the activation for uh, what is a major incident and it's something probably the biggest learning point I personally took away. The fact that the, the, the rains were coming and the longevity of it um, that, that we should be pressing the button a lot uh, quicker. Yeah. So certainly for the county, certainly for the county councils and the district councils, um, and, and I'm acutely aware of the frustration around this was becoming a major incident, uh, and, and the effect it was happening uh, on the communities. We should have done, could have done a lot more, a lot earlier. Um, and we've realised that, and what we have done is we've put in a communication line um, uh, as part of the process, so that even if we're even concerned and it's just at an escalation point, and not even at a declaration point, those phone calls will be made and the key people that, that will need to be part of the local resilience forum will be spoken to, to allow everyone then to make a informed decision as to what needs to be done at that point. Even if nothing needs to be done, it's for people to be talking earlier and engaging earlier. And it's a very, very important point we've taken away. It's also a point we know came from the communities as well, uh, and you raised those concerns. So with that, we can then rapidly and effectively disseminate information out there, and we can collectively monitor and assess what's going on. We can then, it helps us determine what our priorities are um, for the greater good. I just wanted to quickly mention the military. Um, and I have to say, we had excellent support, both on the ground, but also within the planning stages. But it also caused a hell of a headache as well. Um, we had the political announcement to say forces had, that were going to give military assistance, but there was no processes in place on how they would be deployed. And there's a very clear difference from being deployed as part of the military to being actually employed. Uh, and we had no idea who was going to pay uh, and the funding uh, for it. Um, there was potential conflict on the ground because, quite rightly, com communities were expecting that support and that instant attention for it and request for services. But certainly in the initial stages, military personnel didn't know whether they could go outside their battle command, which then created uh, an issue. There was also expectations that they could undertake local taskings without having to go through the coordination centre. However, part of the debrief and, and what we've learned from that is that they are excellent military planners, of course they are, and they can bring a hell of a lot to, the, um, to us when we're dealing with any major incident. And it's been looked at, and the Ministry of Defence are reviewing how we can be more on the front foot, particularly around environment agency as well, as with all the blue light agencies. And what they want to do in the future is look at sending out military planners that can come out and actually look at what the problem is to assess what resources are required and how then that problem can be dealt with. Uh, volunteers, uh, I, I know we've had an opportunity to, to, to thank um, um, our own staff um, uh, and I would like to add that for mine because they did a phenomenal job. 
But I'd also like to do a heartfelt thanks to the volunteers. Um, there are people here as individuals, as neighbours, community groups, charities, um, that absolutely went out of their way and made incredible personal sacrifices with it. And I think without the volunteers, we would have really taken on a hell of a lot longer and taken on a lot more pain than what we did. However, it has been recognised locally and nationally that it has to be done in a more coordinated way. There was an awful sense of frustration, not only just on the ground and with the communities and, and, and you as individuals and teams, but equally from us, where we didn't have a, a grip of all the volunteers that had the very best intentions and have probably had independent skills <coughs> far outweigh any individuals that we have as part of the individuals. This has been recognised nationally and they are working on a, a piece of work with a team of emergency responders with a voluntary services of people like St John's, uh, British Red Cross, the Cabinet Office to, to look at an aspiration of any major incident happening um, it is coordinated under one umbrella uh, and that coordination and response can be done with those, those teams. And I think going forward, particularly with another flood event, that would, have, that would help. So just to close, really, around what to expect, uh, and just touching on what I've, I've said already, there is a revised activation response plan. So even before it escalates or in a, a major incident is declared, um, we are going to be talking, and we're going to be talking far more effectively and making some key decisions. Um, uh, and what to decide what the priorities are going to be. Um, we need to coordinate volunteers at an early at the earliest opportunity. And I know there's a lot of work that's been done locally with the district and county councils around voluntary work. We already have a very strong membership uh, on our uh, local resilience forums, and I know there's a very, very healthy representation from the Somerset Voluntary Services here, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, but it has to be coordinated and I know one of the key issues that has come out from all this from voluntary is that in a coordinated way we must be able to keep volunteers safe and I think we'd all agree certainly with some of the depths of the water and what was unknown beneath there was a real risk for individuals so we're looking to coordinate that uh, uh, more effectively and actually come up with a local solution that we can deal with locally um, but can be done for any emergency situation. We've touched on media, and I won't go into too much detail about that, except for, and, and we all do, uh, social media just charges along, and it's very hard to keep up, but we must do. It is one of the probably key mediums to get it through. And, and as many of you know, we used a vast array of media, but for some that wasn't good enough. And we need to keep challenging ourselves on how we can make that better, how we can coordinate it about, and, and use call people to be able to send out that message and make sure that message is received by absolutely everyone. So we're working hard on that. It's interesting to see how with Twitter, uh, as we monitored it throughout the duration, where good stories or good news stories or actions that had to be done were sent out and were retweeted hundreds and hundreds of times. But if um, a message went out that was factually incorrect or malicious, um, it didn't get retweeted that it had been changed or had been uh, corrected, but it left, again, that absolute fear of crime or a fear of helplessness. Uh, and that's something we need to be more responsive to. And my final point really is around knowledge. As dreadful as the situation was and how it played out with absolutely everyone, is that we have all uh, taken something from it. We've all gone through both positive and negative, whether it's through the operation or it's been as a community or, or a, a resident, you've lost your house, your livelihood, your business. But actually there's things that we can all take away because we know that we will do things differently next time. <coughs> no different to the plans that we set out here. We could have the best set of plans, but a different change of circumstances mean we have to adapt. It's no different from, from us as individuals living in this <coughs> area. We know we will get flooded again. We know there's been some brilliant work and excellent effort being put in to try and mitigate some of that. But we all know we will do something, even if it's smaller, but it will make a difference going to the future. That's no different from how we've, we've commanded this major incident and, and the lessons learned that we take very major incident we do that. 
it's no different to how we brief our staff and how we make sure we put those messages out. We will always constantly strive to improve. We have gone through what was described as an unprecedented event. Uh, it won't be the only one. It won't be the only unique one. And we need to just develop and make sure that we do it, sharing information, we do it in a joint way, and we do it to make sure that we keep you safe for the next time. Thank you very much.